So with everything in the world seeming to centre around the coronavirus pandemic, it's easy to overlook the ongoing Brexit saga. Quite honestly, even here at TLDR we're losing track of what season it is for Brexit, but we're sure that you'll let us know in the comments regardless. So in this video, we'll be recapping what's been going on with Brexit, with the deadlines and the negotiations. Before we start, a quick shout out to our book, Brexit The Colouring Book. We mentioned this first a couple of weeks ago, but we made a book which takes you through the whole timeline of Brexit. If you want to grab one, be sure to do so quickly, as our special offers, including this big bundle deal, end on Wednesday 15th. There's a link to the store down below. For those of you who have been taking the opportunity that this current pandemic has given you to ignore the developments in Brexit, here's an incredibly quick recap. You might remember that there's been a lot of talk about deadlines, and whether the UK will extend the negotiating period due to the coronavirus chaos. But at the end of June, Prime Minister Boris Johnson had yet to negotiate an extension past the end of December. June 30th was the deadline to request such an extension, meaning, in effect, that the transition period is definitely going to conclude at the end of this year, bar any crazy legal wranglings. That means that by the end of 2020, the UK will no longer be a member of the Single Market or Customs Union, and will need to agree to a bespoke trade deal if they don't want to conduct trade on No Deal WHO terms. It's also important to note that Prime Minister Boris Johnson has set another deadline for September, the date he hopes to have a deal agreed by, which in effect means that if the UK and EU want a trade deal, it must be negotiated by then. The logic is that it will allow businesses time to adjust, ready for the end of the transition period at the end of the year. So that's enough about deadlines, on to the juicy stuff that you've been waiting for. The common fisheries policy. Who doesn't love an extended discussion on the minutiae of the regulations surrounding fishing? I'm only partially joking. So one big hurdle in the negotiations currently is related to what exactly is going to happen to the common fisheries policy. Back in 2016, when the referendum was still taking place, it feels like a different lifetime, doesn't it? The fisheries policy was a big issue. In fact, Nigel Farage even tried to explain the concept to Joey Essex, star of The Only Way is Essex. Have you watched The Only Way is Essex before? I have to confess, no. Do you know what a bejazzle is? No. Hello, how are you doing? All right, sir. What are we doing today? What's the plan? Well, the plan is... To... And why are we in Grimsby? Uh, because it's symbolic okay. of what's gone wrong. This, if we come here 40 years ago, yep. there were thousands of men working here, the massive trawler fleet, big fish filleting factories. It was, it was the biggest fishing port in the country. Yep. We joined the European Union. We now have to share all our fish with all the other European countries, which I think rightfully should be ours. Anyway, the point is that it's important. The fisheries policy is an agreement within the EU to regulate fishing, especially exactly who can fish where, for how long, etc. The big issue is that the UK fishing industry feels particularly hard done by it. The Common Fisheries Policy basically looks at how many of each type of fish there are year by year, and then splits them based on the number of fish that were caught between 1973 and 1978, when the policy came into force. This is a principle known as relative stability. The basic principle is that each country is given a quota of fish they're allowed to catch, regardless of how many fish are in their waters. Additionally, fish are seen as a common resource by the EU. What that means is that other EU nations have the ability to fish in each other's EEZs, exclusive economic zones, as long as they don't exceed the quotas that I mentioned earlier. The idea is that this provides a fixed equitable split of fish for each country. Each country always has the same number of fish available to them, preventing arguments about who's allowed to fish where. It also allows countries to fish in other nations' waters, allowing them more freedom over the type of fish they want. So from the EU's perspective, it guarantees the quantity of fish each country is allowed, prevents disputes, and introduces more variety. The problem is that UK fishermen do not like this policy at all. They'd say that the policy, introduced in 1970, suppresses the UK fishing industry, as since 1973, the number of fishermen in the UK has halved. This has specifically annoyed fishermen because half of the EU waters are actually made up by UK waters. 
but the UK is only allowed to fish 25% of the fishing quota. In fact, so many UK fishermen don't like this policy that 92% of fishermen reportedly voted leave, with them citing the common fisheries policy as the main reason for this. Michel Barnier has claimed that the EU wants similar access to the current arrangement through the common fisheries policy. But why does it matter what he thinks? The UK is set to leave the EU. Why don't we just take back our fishing rights and have done with it? Well, that's not exactly how negotiations work. While it is true that the UK can, to an extent, just use Brexit as an opportunity to take back full control of its waters and just have the issue done with, this will reduce the chance of getting a free trade agreement signed off on. The UK doesn't want a link between fishing policy and trade, and would prefer to see them dealt with separately, so they can pick and choose what they want, negotiating a trade deal without giving any access to fishing waters. And as you might expect, the EU see them as inherently linked, and has, in the past, made clear that no free trade agreement can be made without some agreement on fishing rights for the EU. Despite the position that the UK has taken, it's important to note that the UK usually exports a lot of fish. In fact, in 2018, around 80% of cod, mackerel and shellfish were exported back to the EU. Which means that if fishermen want their fish to remain competitive abroad, some sort of trade agreement needs to be done to ensure that import tariffs don't destroy their livelihoods. Therefore, even if they hate the fisheries policy, it appears to be in UK fishermen's interests to come up with some sort of agreement on them to ensure that a trade deal can be reached. So originally, the EU wanted to keep the system fairly similar. Their idea was to set a fixed split of the total number of fish allowed to be caught between the UK and EU, and this would be included in the trade deal. The proportion could be changed, but ideally from the EU side, it would be based on the relative stability principle we mentioned earlier, at least partly because that principle is weighted towards the EU. They did concede that this could be changed in the future, based on an agreement between the UK and EU. The UK wanted to go down a different route. They wanted to scrap the principle of relative stability, which makes sense, as it's caused fishermen to resent the current system and gives a bias to EU fishermen against UK fishermen. Instead, Britain wants to go for a system known as zonal attachment. This system means that the proportion of fish allowed to be caught is directly related to the number of fish in each partner's zone. Each year, this agreement will be made between the UK and EU, and if an agreement is not reached, then no fishing will be able to happen in each other's territories. The reason this is beneficial to the UK is because it redresses the relative stability situation, giving the UK proportional rights to the number of fish in its waters. So, what is the progress on this? Has either side backed down? Well, unusually, yes. Michel Barnier has claimed that he can in fact see the EU agreeing to the UK's proposed system of zonal attachment. In fact, if you look really closely past the absolute plastering of adverts on the Express's website, you can see their headline, EU to back down over fishing row. However, Barnier has also claimed that there needs to be some more give and take between both sides, and that although the EU side could agree to zonal attachment, the system needs work to allow for systems like historic fishing rights. So clearly more needs to be done, and the Guardian has even claimed that the EU's willingness to compromise on issues such as fishing policies has not been reciprocated by the UK, and that this is part of the reason that talks have broken up early over serious disagreements. Now, for those of you who have managed to sit through my lecture on fishing quotas, well done to you for that, we'll now move on to some other areas where there's still disagreement between the UK and EU. Because despite its political potency, fishing only actually represents 0.1% of the UK's economy, so there are certainly other important issues to be discussed. One other area of disagreement is in relation to financial services. By the 1st of June, some background work was meant to be completed by both sides in order to create rules that would allow financial services to continue operating between the UK and EU. This paperwork is called equivalence. The expectation was that each side would complete the paperwork, the systems both sides used are deemed equivalent, and the British financial services sector will be able to continue their work in the European Union, something that's very important 
with the sector representing 6.9% of UK GDP. However, it's now July, and this has still not been completed. So, who's to blame for this? Well, as is to be expected, in true grown-up international negotiations, both sides blame each other. The EU claims that the UK was sent 28 questionnaires by the EU, and only four were completed. The UK claims that Brussels works slowly, and blames them for giving them over a thousand pages of questionnaires, with a scope much larger than is necessary. So, this in itself, while not explicitly part of trade talks between the UK and EU this week, has come back up, and contributed to the talks being cut short. But what else is happening in the EU at the moment? Well, good question. Very good question. As part of the rotating presidency of the Council of the European Union, it's the turn of Germany and their leader Angela Merkel to take up the presidency. This is set to continue until the end of the year, when the UK is meant to be fully leaving the EU. If you want to find out more about what this actually means for Europe, then check out the video we put out on TLDR News EU, which discusses exactly that. And just a hint, it has some serious implications for the response to coronavirus. However, it could also make a big difference to Brexit negotiations, and under a German presidency, we could see a shift in strategy. But anyway, what do you think? Do you think that the UK or EU is to blame for not finishing the equivalence paperwork? And what kind of outcome do you want, or do you think that's likely to result from the Brexit negotiations? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. As always, you can also get involved in the conversation over on Discord. Thanks so much for watching, and be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we post a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name listed at the end of videos, be sure to check out the link to Patreon in the description.